Okay, so our guest speaker tonight, Sharon Morrissey. She's a consumer horticulture agent for the Milwaukee County UW Extension. And her presentation will be your lawn, organic, conventional, or in between. Since 1992, Sharon has worked for the UW Extension in Milwaukee. Prior to that, she served as director of the University of Connecticut's Bartlett Arboretum in Stamford. She's also authored a book, Large Flowering Shrubs for the Midwest. And the topic she's going to discuss tonight are what kind of lawn would you want, the, probably the best way to mow it, and the efficiency, efficiently watering your lawn, what some of the best methods are. She's going to talk about fertilizers. She's going to talk about organic gardening, organic ways of dealing with your lawn, and also chemicals, and also how can you assume that your, your lawn is safe for kids to play on. So she's going to touch on a number of things. Uh, as always, we're going to have a break about midway through the show. She'll let you know. And behind me here on the uh, chalkboard is Door County Gardener at Gmail. If you would be so kind as to let us know how we're doing and how much you've enjoyed our program, if you could just click onto that and leave us a little message, we would greatly appreciate that. So I think without further ado, I'll give you Sharon Morrissey then. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you for inviting me to speak to the group tonight. I really am honored to be asked, and uh, it was a pleasure to come up here today. It only took two and a half hours. I allowed five. It looked like a long way. <laughs> <laughs> and I am staying at a hotel down the road, and it was really, really nice because when I got to the lobby reception desk, they had a little stand there with kind of the happenings for the week. And the very first thing on today's, it was the very first thing for today, and it said, Door County Master Gardeners, Sharon Morrissey. And I was like, I wanted to say to the girl, that's me. We're a small town. <laughs> well, and it doesn't take much to excite me either, but that, <laughs> but that was real nice. It was very welcoming. I liked that. So. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and I appreciate the organization of this group and how, uh, how diligent you were about contacting me and getting all the information to me, too. Um, I work with Master Gardeners in Milwaukee and Waukesha County. We have a little bit larger group than you do. We have 431 certified Master Gardeners in our group currently, and our listserv is about 650 master gardeners who are members and also certified people. So we have a very large group and we do lots of educational programs and the thing I find common with almost all master gardeners is that I think learning is kind of the number one thing for all of you. You have this craving to learn more all the time and so the educational programs are important to you. And then, you know, when you came into it you probably thought, well, okay, I'll do some volunteer service too. And then you find out that the volunteer service is educational too, plus you get to meet all these other nice gardeners, and, uh, but the learning is the thing that really hooks you into this. So I hope that uh, you get a lot of the program this evening. You know, this is kind of a controversial topic. And uh, I won't make anybody admit your preferences for lawn care and your feelings about lawn care. You know, I personally have to be a little careful about my letting my feelings come through, too. We all have opinions, right? Um, but as Master Gardeners and as representatives of UW Extension, we do need to make sure that we provide all of the options to people so that they can make an informed decision. That's the most important thing. So I think it's important for all the Master Gardeners to know as much about these topics as possible, regardless of what your personal point of view is or your personal opinion is. So we're going to kind of cover it all tonight. And um, you'll, I, I hope you picked up a brochure on your way in. Um, this brochure is one that I worked with my Master Gardeners to produce. For about five years now, I've been very fortunate to have a team of professional graphic artists who are master gardeners. It's a dream come true for me. <laughs> I just am so choked up about it because it was such a wonderful thing to make these really professional looking programs. We also have displays that go with all of these programs and then the presentation as well. I'll show you some photos of that in a minute. Um, that brochure 
I tried to include, in a very encapsulated form, everything that I could from the new publications that were put out by Dr. Doug Soldot from UW Extension last year. Oh, should I put the shades down? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Do you think we can do it? I, it, fortunately, it's still up on the screen, otherwise it probably couldn't. <laughs> All right. Does that excite everybody every time? Yeah. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> they've seen it before. Yeah, they've seen it a million times before. <laughs> that is so cool. I'm very fortunate to have this center. I know you're, you, uh, are, you know that you're, you're very lucky to have that. But these three publications were put out in 2012, and they were kind of groundbreaking for us because we've wanted to have organic lawn care information for a very long time. And we've looked all over the internet, as some of you probably have too, and we've looked for other extension services in our region to have produced some publications on it, and nobody had. And so Doug Soldat, and some of our other specialists in turf decided somebody's got to do this, we're going to do it. So they put out three, these three publications, and I did bring a copy for you of the Organic and Reduced Risk Lawn Care, because this really gets to the heart of the matter. There's also the Do-It-Yourself Alternative Lawn Care and one on lawn fertilization. And I've been teaching extension principles of lawn care for a very long time, and with Doug's new research that he did since he has re re arrived at the UW Extension, we found out that there's some things that we were recommending that were wrong. And there was a very good reason for that. Um, we're not going to go into that, but we're gonna, <laughs> we are going to correct that now. And there are some new things that you need to learn when you're making recommendations for lawn care. So hopefully this presentation will kind of refresh your memory because you're probably already aware of a lot of those. But we have lots of other publications in extension on lawn care. And it's a very, very good set of publications that we've got on a lot of different aspects of lawn care. That growing grass in the shade and the aeration and top dressing, uh, those are two very common problems people have. So it's nice to have these good publications on them. And you've probably heard people ask questions about the supina bluegrass. Isn't there that bluegrass that'll grow in the shade and it's a low low, you don't have to do anything to it? Um, so we have a publication on that too. So it's just nice to know. And then we have a whole slew of things on pests. In southeastern Wisconsin, we don't have too much trouble with insect pests. So we don't do make very many recommendations for insecticides. If you have a problem that be gets diagnosed as being an insect problem, then you treat. But it doesn't need to be a standard practice. And the same thing with diseases. And with diseases, you'll find through this presentation too that we don't usually recommend any treatment for diseases. They kind of take care of themselves. Now, some of that might be somewhat different up here. I'm not sure Carrie and I and Coggin and I were talking earlier, and it sounds like you don't have a lot of insect pests up here on lawns either. So that's a good thing. We don't have to worry about a lot of that. But a lot of people do worry about that, <laughs> whether they need to or not. And just some other publications. These are available through the Hort team website. These are our X-Series fact sheets. The ones on this slide are from the Learning Store, from the Publications Office. So look in both places and you'll find just really a lot of very good publications. This is our booth on lawn care on this subject, on this topic. Uh, that we do for the Home and Garden Show. Every year we have a booth there and we change the topic every year. And this is what I work with the graphic artists on to produce these lovely, really high quality displays and then these brochures to go with them. And we have about, um, about 11,000 visitors that come through that show and talk to the master gardeners during the period of that show, which is about a week long. And it, it's interesting, I have a, a photo that uh, last year I got to the home show on a night when there wasn't a whole lot going on. It was really dead for some reason. I don't know if it was weather or another sporting event or something, but there weren't very many people there. And I kind of walked past the aisles as I was walking toward the Master Gardener booth, and hardly anybody there. And I got to the aisle the Master Gardener booth was in, and I looked down the aisle, and all the booths along there were empty of visitors. But there was this 
cluster of people around the Master Gardener booth. People really appreciate your information and our information that we give out. So this display, we always have that large pop-up display, plus we have another six-panel display that we can provide information on. Um, and here's a close-up of that display. We've done these on, um, our first one was on small space, small budget vegetable gardening. The next one was on trouble-free tomatoes. Uh, then we did this one, then we did one on top. Uh, tender Loving Care TLC for trees, and this year it's on do-it-yourself fruits. So, um, more to come, and that stuff is on our Milwaukee County website if you want those brochures, and you're free to download those and use those as you want. So, you know, even if you say you don't care too much about your lawn, I bet everybody kind of liked to have a lawn like this. If you didn't have to do anything extra to it, and you could have a lawn that looked like this, wouldn't you do it? Yeah, probably. This is probably more the reality for a lot of people. <laughs> That's my lawn. I mean, it's not a picture of my lawn, but my lawn looks like that. Sure, you know. Um, and is this a natural lawn? People say, oh, well, it's natural. As long as it's green, I don't care. But when you've got 95% creeping Charlie, there's a lot more of us who care a little bit more uh, about how good our lawns look. So the topic is conventional, organic, or somewhere in between because there are people at both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between. And we can provide help for them, starting with the basics. And those basics are kind of on the front of this brochure, the mowing, watering, and fertilizing. You do those three things right, and then the rest of the stuff it doesn't have to be done as intensively. You don't have to do a lot more. A healthy, vigorously growing lawn is the best solution to all of your other lawn problems. So learning how to do those things right will help you to reduce weeds, to avoid insect and disease problems, to avoid thin lawns, um, and to care for lawns in sh uh, shady areas, to not have to worry about soil erosion and surface roots, because you can handle all that through those three basic cultural practices. So let's go over those real quickly. And these pretty much haven't changed. Mowing, set the mower as high as you can, two and a half to three inches high or more if your lawn mower will do it. Do any of you mow your lawns that high? Was it something you had to kind of get used to? Yeah. Because it's a look that looks a little scruffy because it's so long, it looks like the lawn needs to be mowed, you know? You're used to saying, oh, that height, it needs to be mowed. but it's better for the lawn because it shades out a lot of the weeds um, and you're not mowing off more than uh, a third of the plant at a time. And you're leaving the clippings on the lawn. So those are two other things that you need to do right. You leave those clippings on the lawn, you're adding nutrients back into the soil and you avoid a whole fertilizer application each year by just leaving your clippings on the lawn. So that's one fertilizer application less that you need to do. And by not mowing off more than a third of the height at a time, you're not killing off some of the, the plants, which causes those dead plants to leave sheaths and roots and crowns of the grass plants to create thatch. If you mow too short at one time, if you take off too much at any one time, so you can avoid the problem of thatch by mowing properly at the right times and then sharpening your lawnmower blade. And this is what an unsharp lawnmower blade will do to your lawn. And it just, it looks bad. It's also, because you'll see sort of this cast, this kind of yellowish cast over the lawn. So you can really tell the lawnmower blade probably needs to be sharpened. But also think about anything else that you prune or clip. You would never leave a jagged edge like that. You'll act, the plant will actually lose more water through a, a surface that's been cut that jaggedly like that. So you can help the health of your plant by just sharpening your lawnmower blade too. And then those grass clippings. People always think, and you've probably heard this before when you talk to people, that if you leave your clippings on the lawn that it contributes to thatch. Lawn clippings do not um, contribute to thatch especially if you mow often enough and you're not cutting off any large clippings or long clippings. 
If you have long clippings and they mat on the lawn and you leave them in mats on the lawn, that can do some damage to the lawn. But just normal grass clippings do not contribute to thatch because thatch is just a buildup of the dead roots and stems and the sheaths of the individual grass plants. The clippings themselves are 95% water. They dehydrate and dry out like that. So, and then the rest of it's pretty much nitrogen. So clippings are actually a good thing. Um, and I, I like this picture because I think this shows what thatch is better than anything. It looks sort of like a cocoa doormat in between the grass blades and the soil. And we used to say if you had a half inch or more that you should do something about it. But now they're saying an inch. You can let it go up to an inch without it really causing too much trouble. If it goes beyond an inch, then you should probably do something about it. And we will talk about that. Okay, so that's lawn mowing. Any questions about lawn mowing? Anything else you want to add? So, good lawn, care, lawn mowing practices. People think, oh, there's nothing to mow in lawn. But there is. There's a way to do it right. And then watering. This is one that I've kind of turned around on as I've learned more from Dr. Soldat and his research and the issue of phosphorus running off into lakes and streams and the phosphorus ban we have on fertilizer now because phosphorus is carried by soil and organic matter that runs off of a lawn. And if a lawn is thin, there'll be more exposed soil to run off and carry phosphorus with it. But if you can keep your lawn thicker, you're gonna have less runoff and your lawn will be healthier and able to compete better with the weeds that are the other big pest problem that most people use some product to control. So, you know, we always used to say you don't have to water in the summer, the lawn turns brown, it's not dead, it's just dormant, right? And that's true, but your lawn will be thinner if you allow it to go dormant all summer long. So that's kind of your call, how you want to handle that. I have a postage stamp size yard, so it's not that hard for me to water my lawn. And the year that I decided to religiously water my lawn was two summers ago. Remember that drought we had? It was a good year to make that decision. I decided that before the drought happened. But, um, you know, when your lawn has suffered like that through a, a hard summer, it's going to be thinner, and then you don't have the advantages of that thicker lawn. So, you know, it's a, per, it's a personal choice, but there are pros and cons to it. When you do water, you should provide an inch of water all at once, unless you have very sandy soils. What are the soils like up here? Sandy loam? Sandy loam? So is it very alkaline? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's similar to southeastern Wisconsin too, but we have very heavy clay soils. Um, so if you have very sandy soils where the water runs through really, really quickly, then they recommend that you water twice a half inch each time, or maybe even three quarters of an inch each time to really get the lawn well watered. Because if you just put an inch on it runs right through, it's like only having given your lawn about a half inch. So uh, in really sandy soils, it's different. But probably with a, sand, with a sandy loam, you can probably do an inch of water all at once. And that's to get the roots to go down deeply into the soil. And you know that, right, from your trainings. How do you know how when you've put down an inch of water? Use a straight-sided can to collect the water under the sprinkler. And when you've collected an inch, you have put down an inch on all of that surface. That's something that kind of confuses people sometimes. And the new publication, the fourth new publication that Dr. Soldat and his group put out was on lawn watering. And boy, if you want to know exactly how to put down an inch of water on your lawn and exactly how to measure it and figure it out and calculate, he even does math in that, read that publication probably a lot more than most people need to know about putting an inch of water in your lawn. You put a straight side of can out, you collect it, you put an inch of water on it. Um, but there is that publication if you want to know more about it. 
water less in the shade. Dealing with shade, you water less. And water early in the morning or during the night um, so that the grass can dry off as quickly as possible. So the blades of grass don't stay wet. Um, it's a period of leaf wetness, the length of that leaf wetness, that determines whether the fungal spores for lawn diseases have a chance to germinate or not. They have to have enough water for a long enough period of time to do that. So the faster you can get that lawn to dry off, the better off it is. So, any other comments about watering? What do you think about, do you water your lawn during the summer? When you said less for shade, like by how much? Um, by half, Okay, I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> because it dries out less quickly, that makes sense. And then there's that whole issue of exposed roots under trees. And people say, well, I can't grow grass in the shade because I don't have any grass underneath my Norway maple. Is that a common one around here? Spruce. Spruce. And part of that is because it's shaded it so much that the grass can't grow in that area. Then the soil becomes exposed. Then that soil washes away. Then the roots become exposed. So it's not just that the roots have become exposed and have moved up in the soil. Um, and uh, in some circumstances, you know, you can lighten up the canopy, but that's not easy to do. In a Norway maple, you'd have to cut quite a few branches out of there to get it lightened up to get enough light in there. And under a spruce, you don't want to remove branches from a spruce. So in those areas, don't grow grass. How about showing fescues? Even the chewing fescues, you know, that's selecting the right grass seed for shade is really important. So the fescues are the best choice for shade, but at times you can't even get those to grow in very shady areas. Question? Yes? What do you do about areas that are maybe 10 by 10 in a large lawn that dry out just repeatedly? You might be near the edge of the lawn where there are pine trees nearby. Well, some of the practices we're going to talk about is, is top dressing and aeration. And top dressing particularly may help to add more organic matter to the soil, which may help to hold more moisture in those areas. Um, the, it, otherwise, I think it probably is just a matter of watering more often in those areas that dry out more quickly. The soil must be different there in order for it to dry out faster than other areas of the lawn. There must be something else going on there. I think the addition of organic matter through top dressing probably is going to be the best bet to put some more, more organic matter in that soil to hold more moisture. All right, let's move on to fertilization. Now, fertilization is part of what really, really changed with Dr. Soldat's research that he did. So, if you haven't become familiar with these publications, this could be quite different than you're used to. This fertilizing is really important because it keeps the lawn dense. And I already talked about dense lawns and how important it is for weed control and to prevent the runoff of phosphorus <coughs> from the organic matter that, that erodes from a thin lawn. One of the things Dr. Soldat added is to choose fertilizers with at least 25 to 50 percent slow release nitrogen. And we'll go into a lot more detail on how to figure out whether the fertilizer you're using has that percentage of slow release nitrogen or not. Now, by that, you don't mean 25 to 50% nitrogen. You mean 25 the to 50% of the nitrogen should be in a slow release form. Very good point. Very good point. And to apply it at the proper times for the age of your lawn, and that's something that he added too that we never talked about with people before. It didn't matter what age your lawn was, the fertilizer recommendations were the same. They're not anymore. They're also different for different light levels, and that has been true, because in the shade you don't need as much fertilizer either. <coughs> and we'll go into that into more detail too. So fertilize less in the shade, and then apply it just before it rains or uh, water it in. It, does, it should be washed off of the grass blades and watered into the soil. And 
Really, ideally, you should do the weed control if you're going to use a product and the feed or the fertilizer part separately because the timing of both is different. We'll go into that into a little bit more detail too. Starting with choosing a fertilizer. And I believe we've got when to fertilize and choosing a fertilizer in the brochure that I gave you. So this will keep you on track. We know that all fertilizer products have three numbers on them. The first is nitrogen. We know that. It's the percent of nitrogen. And lawns need more nitrogen than they do anything else. The second is the percentage of phosphorus. And in Wisconsin, because of the phosphorus ban in lawn fertilizers, that will be zero. And the only exceptions to that are for new lawns. When you're establishing a new lawn, you're allowed to use a phosphorus fertilizer because to get those roots to establish well, they do need some additional phosphorus. And if your soil test shows that your soil is deficient in phosphorus, what are the soils around here like? Do they have a lot of phosphorus or not? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we do in the southeastern Wisconsin too. In fact, we have off the charts both phosphorus and potassium in most people's soil test reports. So um, most people don't have a problem with phosphorus, and so it is a good reason not to add more. And then the third is the percentage of potassium. And this should be zero too, really, because only if your soil test shows that you need potassium, because both phosphorus and potassium are held in the soil, and they don't wash out like nitrogen does. Um, if you have low potassium, they will recommend a winterizer type fertilizer for you from the soils lab. All right, now going to that nitrogen, 25 to 50% of the nitrogen should be in slow release form. So nitrogen in the fertilizer products is in two forms, slow release and quick release, sometimes called insoluble, the slow release, and soluble for the fast release. 25 to 50% of that should be slow release. What happens is that the green up <coughs> of your lawn when you put down the fertilizer will be slower. And a lot of people are used to being able to put a fertilizer down and have the lawn turn green, nice and green, real quickly, within a few days. If you've watered it nicely, within a couple of days. But they found that the slow release nitrogen lasts for about eight weeks, whereas the fast release nitrogen lasts for about four. So you get twice the length of time that your lawn has that nitrogen to use. It'll green up. It just greens up slower, but it lasts a lot longer. Organic fertilizers have mostly slow-release nitrogen. That's part of what an organic product is. Something that's organic, organic really means that the product or the, the uh, item has carbon in it. And because it has carbon in it, it's a complex molecule. It's much more complex than the synthetic fertilizers that have had all that stripped out of it, and we're down to just the basic nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. With that carbon in there, those larger molecules, in order for the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to be available to the plants, there has to be some weathering to break down those bonds and get rid of the carbon. So the plants can't use the nitrogen until the carbon has been, um, has been, uh, the bonds have been broken and the carbon have, has been separated from it. And that takes time and weathering. So organic fertilizers are carbon-based from living or former Really, only after about two years, you've only used up about 20 to 50 percent of the nitrogen that you put down because it's released so slowly. So if you're using an organic fertilizer like manures or compost or a fertilizer product that has been developed that has uh, organic materials in it, then the lawn will be less green than with conventional fertilizers 
for the first couple of years, you're not going to get the green up, um, not that really bright green. And but to compensate, you might want to apply twice, twice as much for the first few years that you're going to an all-organic fertilizer. Because it takes that much longer for that organic fertilizer to break down and become available to the plants. So what are the quick release and the slow release fertilizers? Quick release sources of nitrogen include ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, urea, and other forms of urea that are kind of stabilized so that they don't break down quite so quickly. And then the slow release nitrogens will be coated urea, sometimes it's called sulfur coated or, or a polymer coated urea. Any of the biosolids like melorganite or any of the sewage sludge products, manures, and any other natural forms of organic matter that have nitrogen in them. Those are all slow release nitrogen forms. Now, if you're going for an organic lawn, however, the biosolids are not approved for organic production of food, that is. So it's up to you whether you want to use it on your lawn or not. The only reason is that those biosolids, um, I have to think about this for a minute because it, it no longer has to do with heavy metals. Um, I guess because of the processing that they don't, they, they feel that it's not been purified enough and it can still have carryovers in it. So the biosolids are not approved for organic production of food. We'll talk about that in a minute too. So when we look at this label up here, we've got 24% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, and 12% potassium. And when you look in the ingredients in the bag, you'll see that with nitrogen, it breaks it down for you, and then maybe you can see it a little better here. It says that that 24% nitrogen, of that, 1.5% is ammoniacal nitrogen. That's a fast-release nitrogen, right? 7.5% is a urea nitrogen. That's a fast-release nitrogen. 10% other water-soluble nitrogen. So that's fast-release too, except there's that all-important little asterisk there. And then there's a double asterisk after the 5% water-insoluble nitrogen. And those asterisks are really important because when you look at the single asterisk at the very bottom of that second section, it says that of that 10% water-soluble nitrogen, 1.37% of it is slowly available. So even though it says it's water-soluble nitrogen, part of it's not water-soluble, and that needs to be counted toward your slowly-soluble nitrogen. So unfortunately, it's very confusing and you have to know how to analyze the product ingredients that are on the label. So what you need to do is, if you add the percents of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, they equal 24. I mean, I'm sorry, if you add the percents of nitrogen, they equal 24, not 100. So you add 1.5, 7.5, 10, and 5, that equals 24. So that's the 24% nitrogen. If you divide each of those individual portions by 24 and then multiply by 100, you find the percent of each thing that is in that nitrogen. So, doing that as an example, the slow release nitrogen, we have 1.37% slowly available nitrogen from the urea. We have 5% water insoluble nitrogen. Those are the only two things on there that are slow release. So that's 6.37% slow release nitrogen. You divide that by 24, because that's the total amount of nitrogen. Multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percent. And you come up with 26.54% slow release nitrogen. 
So if you had first looked at this bag and said, okay, those top three things, and you add them all together, and gosh, the majority of this product is fast release, so it can't possibly be 25 to 50% slow release like it's supposed to be. But if you do the math, which I have to tell you, I'm a horticulturist. I am not a mathematician. Um, I, don't do, I don't like doing math. I don't do math well. <laughs> but there are times when math is really important, and this is one of them, where it really does make a difference when you take a look at it this way. Then this product qualifies for that 25 to 50% slow release nitrogen that's recommended by the university. Okay? So it's a good thing we all have calculators on our phones. And when you go to the garden center and you're looking for your fertilizer product, you can do the math. And I'm sure all of you do math better than I do. So that was a how to select a fertilizer product so you know you're getting the type of nitrogen source that you need. And then when to fertilize. Well, we used to say we fertilize by the holiday schedule. And our most important fertilizer application of the year was Halloween, right? Not so much anymore. That has changed. And we have three sets of conditions. We have young lawns that are less than 20, 15, 10 to 15 years old, older lawns that are 15, 10 to 15 years old or more, and then lawns where people collect their clippings. So, how many of you have a lawn that's older, 10 to 15 years old or more? Yeah, see, I think a lot of people, that's the case. And this also qualifies for shady lawns. For those, you only need to apply fertilizer twice a year. Memorial Day and Labor Day. It says nothing about early April, which is when everybody wants to go out and fertilize their lawns. And it says nothing about October, Halloween. <coughs> Lawns that are younger than that, we do recommend three fertilizer applications, but we still don't say anything about April or October. Memorial Day, Independence Day, and Labor Day. So this is quite a switch from what we were saying before. Yes? Wouldn't that be determined, I mean, if you did a soil test, I mean, if you have a sandy soil, of course you're going to have less nutrients. So, you know, wouldn't a soil test still be your best option rather than age? Um, to get a true perspective. Yes, it is important to have a soil test, but the problem is that really the only thing we need to add to our lawns is nitrogen. And a soil test does not show how much nitrogen is in the lawn, in the soil because nitrogen is this water-soluble element that leaches through the soil and changes from day to day. So they, they give you a recommendation based on where the lawn is and what type of soil it is, but they don't tell you, they can't tell you how much nitrogen is in, in uh, soil. And they but, always recommend the same, you know, one pound per <laughs> square feet. I mean, and they do. I've done several soil, soil tests in different soils. It's always the and same, same recommendations. <laughs> Three to five pounds per year. <laughs> yep, you're right. You're right. Right. So that's why they're now going by age, because what they have found is that if you fertilize your lawn regularly for 10 to 15 years, there's nitrogen that builds up in the soil organic matter, and it pr provides a reservoir of nitrogen for the lawn for years to come. And it, as it builds up that reservoir over those 10 or 15 years, there's more of it available later that the lawn can draw upon. Um, again, I don't know the, the physics of that. Sounds real good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it, yeah. and then the microorganisms that die and leave their bodies to science, you know, leave their bodies to your lawn, and then that provides more organic matter and more nitrogen. Um, yes, yes? Well, then if all you ever need is nitrogen when your lawn gets old, can we just stop fertilizing altogether? No. Um, 
Because apparently, you know, your lawn is using it all the time. Yeah, but you said that it's always building it up. But it, it always is using some too. So you have to do at least two fertilizer applications a year. For the rest of your life. <laughs> the rest of its life. Yes. that if you manage to achieve over 5% organic matter in your soil and you need a soil test to determine that, you can go without fertilizing, not forever, but you might be able to skip a year, maybe two, and then fertilize again. But reaching that magical over 5% organic matter, uh, you know, that's, that's a process. Yeah, and that 5%, that 5 organic matter is, is difficult to get to, even if you're adding organic matter all the time. Um, have any of you had your soils tested? And do you know what the or percent organic matter is in your soil? How about you up there? Low. Yeah. 2%. Yeah. Even in a vegetable garden where you're adding it all the time, you'll find that it's less than 5% a lot of times. I did find uh, one of my customers, he had 4.7. Wow. And he never does anything to his soil. Wow. So that's but that's unusual. Higher. Oh, yeah, that's an outlier. So, yeah. And then where you remove clippings, and there are people who insist on removing clippings no matter what, you have to add another fertilizer application. But you'll notice that this one is early October. And here's where another part of his research comes in. And that is that they found that when you apply nitrogen um, on October 1st, 50% of that nitrogen will be used up by the grass. If you apply that same nitrogen by the 15, same amount of nitrogen on the 15th of October, only 10% of it will be used. So it's almost a waste to fertilize any later than October 1st. <coughs> and we used to say that the lawn was still using the nitrogen, and, and it was based on research from a different part of the country. That was the problem. Um, what Dr. Soldat did is he went back to say, where did this come from? This just doesn't sound right. And he looked back and looked back and back into the late 50s, early 60s is when they first started making these recommendations for those late fertilizer applications. And this is where it came from. It was not from their research. It was from research from West Virginia. So we now have Wisconsin research. And we know this is what we should be doing. Okay, what we've talked about so far, just good basic lawn care, mowing, watering, and fertilizing. And that can take care of a whole bunch of your problems. And you may not need to do much else to your lawn. I think this is probably a good time to take a break. Oh, we have quest some questions, yes? Earlier you said you should weed and feed separate. Yes. Why don't you get weed? We'll talk about that when we talk about weeds. Later. Yep, we will talk about that. I do that. have a question relating uh, fertilizers. Um, do you know anything about kelp? No, I don't. I don't, I'm sorry. But it is an organic product. I don't know how quickly it breaks down or anything. I would imagine it's slow release, but I don't know anything beyond that. So why don't we take a break now, and when we come back, we'll start talking about your choices. Again? What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> That's right. So you got to know that the green side goes up, right? <laughs> so it's your lawn, it's your choice. That is what this whole thing is about. You can do it any way you want. And who are we to judge others, right? Don't answer that. <laughs> so we've already talked about this. Hiring a lawn care service is an option, and we talked a little bit about that during the break with a couple of people. Um, and unfortunately, I think the lawn care companies get a really bad rep. And I think part of that is because we make them do what they do. Because people who hire lawn care companies expect their lawns to look better than it did when they were caring for it by themselves. And so if you haven't been using fertilizer and you haven't been controlling weeds and you haven't been taking care of insects and stuff and you tell them you don't want them to use any of those nasty chemicals, 
how is it going to look better? <laughs> and you expect it to look better, you're going to fire them. So it puts them in a bad situation. It's very tough for them. And so I, I think that that's one of the reasons that you don't find as many lawn care companies that are willing to let you be the boss and say, I want this kind of fertilizer and I want this kind of pesticide and I want that kind. There are companies that do that, but it's very difficult for them. Would you concur? Yes. <laughs> and so think about that. Um, that it's an expectation that their customers have that kind of make them do what they do. And the other thing that happens is that we make our recommendations for the homeowners and we have certain timings for things like fertilizer applications and weed control and things like that. But lawn care companies, two things. One of them is that they have access to products that we as homeowners don't have access to. And so some of the products that they use have long, wider windows of opportunity for them to put them down and have them still be effective, whereas specifically with herbicides. When we put down herbicides, we have maybe a four-week, six-week window. The products that the lawn care companies are using, they have maybe a six, eight, ten-week window. So, because they can't go to everybody's house the first week of June. You know, they have to be able to spread stuff out. Um, so, you know, don't judge them too harshly when you see them out there at a time when you don't think they should be applying those herbicides or whatever. It could be that they have a different product that they're using where they can <coughs> apply it and it is the proper timing for it. And um, the, other, the other constraint, I guess, is the fact that they can't be at all their clients' places at exactly the same time. They have to be able to spread that out. So it is hard for us to direct a lawn care company too because they can't just you know do a little bit here and a little bit there. If they're a big company, they have to be able to send somebody out to do a bunch in one day. Um, they can't have different programs for every client they go to. So don't be too hard on them. And don't be too judgmental of the people who use them either. You don't have to choose to use one if you don't want to. And understand the constraints that they are working with. But all choices, no matter what you choose to do with your lawn, it starts with good basic care and that's what we just spent the first 45 minutes talking about. So let's start with the conventional choice. This is the, and, and uh, this stuff is really well explained in this publication. And I've tried to just really condense it down here. It relies on the full range of products, synthetic products, for fertilizing, for controlling weeds, for taking care of insects and diseases. These products are all certified by the EPA to be safe with only a low level of risk when used properly, like all of our chemicals. Um, the products are highly effective and very inexpensive compared to the alternatives. So you can have a really wonderful lawn by using these products. So it sucks you in. <laughs> Have any of you ever had um, Jim Studi talk to you about soils? And he talks about tilling your garden. And he says that your tiller, tillers are like crack cocaine. <laughs> they get addictive. <laughs> and that's what some of this stuff does too, is you get addicted to it because it's easy, it's cheap, it's fast, it works beautifully. And they do. Those products work great. Much less labor intensive than doing it organically. Or you can hire a lawn care service and that's really low labor. And this is how you will get the highest quality lawn possible. is by using these products <coughs> and, and using this approach. I don't think anybody would argue any of that. The organic choice at the other end of the spectrum is to use only natural products for fertilizing, controlling weeds, insects, and diseases. Organic gardening is caring for the soil. That's what organic gardening is. That's where it all starts. And that's true with lawn care, too. So organic lawn care starts with good soil care. So when we top dress and we core aerate, we are caring for the soil that our grass is growing in. Dr. Soldat recommends doing it twice a year. That's a lot. Do it once a year. You're still doing some good for the lawn. We were talking at break, someone and I, 
is it really necessary to aerate at all? It does depend on your soil. I bet you'd be the laughing stock of your neighborhood if you <coughs> lived in the central sands and you poor aerated your lawn. Because <laughs> in sandy soils, you probably don't need to. In our soils, heavy clays, <coughs> that soil gets compacted just from walking over it to mow the lawn. Um, if you've got something in between, then you don't need to aerate as often. And top dressing. How many of you have top dressed your lawn? A couple of you. How many of those of you have done it more than once? Okay. How many of you enjoy doing it? <laughs> you do. Okay. You want to come do mine? <laughs> we didn't used to recommend top dressing very much. Um, because it was recommended that you only put down an eighth of an inch and it had to be perfectly even over your entire lawn. And so it really wasn't for home gardens. Um, that has changed and top dressing to add organic matter to improve your soil is part of the organic program for lawn care. But it is with organic lawn care, it is difficult to get results that are comparable to those of the other approaches no matter what you do. And then that somewhere in between is this reduced risk alternative, which they talk about in here. Um, there's a whole section on the back page and a half there on that. It is organic based, but it's less strict. It does allow occasional use of synthetic products, and the products that can be used are, are ones that are on a special list that the EPA has put together of reduced risk pro uh, program of products. It has the same basic soil care as organic. And then those reduced risk products are considered reduced risk by the EPA because they're often natural organisms. They are used at lower rates than other products. They are less toxic to fish and birds. They're less likely to contaminate groundwater. They're less likely to endanger human health. They're mostly only available to commercial applicators, however. So that may be something to hire a lawn care company to do, this kind of reduced risk program. And this, doing kind of a combination, can produce a moderately high quality lawn. I said before that when you know, there was so much demand for an organic lawn care recommendations from the university that they looked around all the states nearby and found that there weren't any extension recommendations. And that's because it was difficult to put together an organic standard. There are no official standards for organic lawn care. Organic standards are for food. Those are the only ones that are really set, is for food production. And so to come up with these recommendations, they had to kind of modify what existed. The other problem is that not all natural products are organic. That national organic program that sets standards for what products can be used is for food production, not lawn care. So you can't just go to that and say, okay, these products are approved for organic lawn care and these are not. There's no body that has decided that. You can look for products that are OMRI approved, that Organic Materials Review Institute approved, and that's a good place to start if you're making those choices. Um, the EPA does exempt certain products from testing and registration, and those are things, I don't think I put them, wait a second, there we go. Um, I, I didn't really put them down here, I think it's somewhere else that I kind of mentioned the fact that these are things that usually are pretty much in their normal form. They haven't had a lot of um, processing done to them, and they haven't been shown to be harmful to, in other ways. Things like the vinegars and the citrus oils and all that kind of stuff. Those are the things that the EPA exempts from testing and registration. But that means that those products haven't been tested. So it doesn't mean that they're gonna, they, they, they won't necessarily hurt your lawn, but they won't necessarily help it either because they haven't been tested. So it was really difficult for them to come up with the things that could be included in an organic lawn care program. Also, most organic products have not been scientifically proven to be effective. 
And that sort of goes back to that, you know, it might not hurt it, but it also might not help it. So it's a waste of money. And legally in Wisconsin, products must meet the vendor claims in order to be legally sold. So if the vendor claims that this product is going to control weeds, it has to do that. But if it hasn't been tested, then you can't prove that it's going to do that. So really, those products shouldn't be included on anything we recommend either, because they really aren't legal to sell in Wisconsin. And most of the products, when you do narrow it down and say, OK, this probably should be included and that should be included, they're expensive, they're less effective, and you do need repeat applications of most of them. So these are the problems that they ran into in trying to determine an organic lawn care program. And a lot of them are very labor intensive, as we'll see in a minute. So it starts with that organic soil care twice a year in the spring and the fall, aerating and top dressing. He says that you can top dress up to an inch of compost spread evenly over your lawn. Here's two pictures of people using, doing that. Here you have the, um, the, I, I don't, the raking method, and here you have the fling method. <laughs> we all done the fling method. <laughs> and then we probably have to do the rake method. But the idea is to get it to look like what's in the middle here. An inch of compost spread evenly is going to be, that's a lot of compost. Even in a small area, that's a lot of compost. And it also needs to be pretty fine, you know. It can't have lots of big clumps in it or you're never going to get it evenly over the lawn. So that is kind of high, high uh, maintenance. Um, they recommend high quality compost. There is a table in this publication that tells you various sources of compost. Um, composted manure actually is high enough in nutrients that if you use composted manure to top dress, you probably don't have to do any other fertilization. Where's, where's Millorganite fit into this program? Uh, well, Millorganite fits in as a, a fertilizer product. Okay. The analysis is high. No, it's not the analysis. It's then you have to put a lot more on because it's only 6% nitrogen. And in order to get a pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet, you have to put on four times more than you would of a product that's 24% nitrogen. So it's the volume. And same thing with manure. You know, it's very low in nitrogen. So you have to put lots of it on to get enough nitrogen. If you use composted yard waste, it's not high enough in nutrients, so you will need to supplement with a fertilizer. You'll still have to do your fertilization. So I decided, okay, that same year I decided to water, I decided in the spring that I was going to do this because Dr. Soldat said you should do this. So I called up the company that I've had to do the <coughs> for aeration occasionally, and um, I asked them for a half inch of composted manure and aeration. I wanted the top dressing and the aeration over my lawn. I have a very small yard. Um, and for the core aeration, it's about $80 to do my entire yard. To do the half inch of, to add that half inch of composted manure, the whole process was going to cost 600. How many square feet do you have? I have about 5,000 square feet. So it's a pretty small yard. $600, needless to say, we did not top dress with composted manure. I think part of it was it took him a long time to get a quote to me, and I asked her about it, and she said, well, we had a hard time finding um, the composted manure from a, a vendor that we could get a quantity of it that would be fine enough to use on the lawn. So hopefully as more people ask for this kind of thing, you know, and, and that's happened with many of the products that we use in horticulture. The more we ask for, think about insecticidal soap. And those of you who have been around for a while, um, you know, 20 years ago, you had to really look around for insecticidal soap, and now it's everywhere. You can get it at the grocery store, just about. <laughs> so, okay, so this is your organic um, soil care. The aeration portion of it, remember he recommends you can do it up to two times a year. You have to core aerate deeply in soft soils. That's not too hard to do. You do it in the spring and the fall because that's when the soil is softest because it's moistest then. Um, 
And in heavy clay soils, we recommend that you use the type of core aerator that has a vertical impact. Um, so it hydraulically pushes those cores down into the soil because just the drum type doesn't go deeply enough. You need to have cores at least this big and you need to have them at least this close together. And so you may have to go over the lawn a couple of times to get them deep enough, uh, to get them close enough together and then you have to use a vertical impact if your soil is heavy to get them deep enough. And you leave the cores on the surface. It looks like a party of Canadian geese had an enormous <laughs> shindig on your lawn when you get done. <laughs> but those cores contain soil and the microorganisms in the soil help to break down the organic matter and release the nutrients from the organic matter and make it available to your lawn. So that's a good thing. So for fertility, that composted manure top dressing, um, there are brands of fertilizers, and I don't know any off the top of my head, and you have to look around for them, more and more of them are becoming available, that contain that 25 to 50% slowly available nitrogen. Um, the organic ones will have up to 100% slowly available nitrogen. And we've already covered that the lawn will be less green for a longer period of time, but it builds up in the soil. You do need larger quantities of the organic fertilizers because they're lower in nitrogen content. Um, and less of that nitrogen is available. So you either be patient or you double the nitrogen. And because you have to put on such large quantities and because it's an organic product, it often is a lot more expensive per unit of nitrogen than the synthetics. And then this is where uh, malorganite fits in. But it doesn't meet the USDA organic standards for food. So it's okay for the reduced risk lawn care um, system. So it's kind of your choice whether you want to use it or not. All right? And now the big thing that everybody thinks about when they think about organic lawn care is they think about pesticides. We've talked about everything but pesticides. And I'm going to start with insect control because it really is the easiest. There are very few organic insecticides available, and their effectiveness varies, as we already talked about why that is. And this is a quote from the publication. The costs can be shocking. <laughs> they're mostly naturally derived products. Um, and so there are things like neem oil that comes from the neem tree. Uh, pyrethrum you're familiar with comes from the chrysanthemum plant. Spinosad is a very promising product that we're using in a lot of, of areas of horticulture now. We use it a lot in the vegetable garden because it's a, from a soil bacterium that was found under a rum keg in Jamaica. So who was looking under these rum kegs? <laughs> no, it was actually an old warehouse that had produced rum, and it was in these areas they found that there were not the same insects and diseases and weeds and such, and so they um, did some testing on them. And found that spinosad is a very effective insecticide, and it can help to control some diseases as well. Milky spore disease, that's another one that can be an insect control. It's not highly recommended. Phil Pelletieri, oh, we're going to miss him so much, um, is uh, not a fan of it unless you really have a lot, a lot of grubs in your lawn. Um, nematodes, endophytes, all those kinds of things are the naturally derived insect control products for organic lawn care. Um, I think I missed a bullet point here because with organic insect, insect control, a well-maintained lawn generally doesn't need a lot of insect control. And the same thing with diseases. A well-cared-for lawn that's been properly mowed, watered, and fertilized doesn't need a lot of, her, of, of uh, disease control. There really are very few diseases that cause significant damage. 
What we find in our area, and it's probably true around, around the state, is that when people come in with a lawn problem, we tell them to bring in a sample they can send. If they won't listen to us, tell them that they don't really need to worry about it. It'll take care of itself eventually. And then they want to send a sample into the disease diagnostic lab, and they send it into the disease diagnostic lab, and they send back a thing, and they say, yeah, we found such and such in your lawn, but the best way to care for it is to properly mow water and fertilize. They almost never recommend a fungicide for a lawn. So um, that proper fertility and proper watering are really important. The fungicides that are available for lawn care um, are sulfur, Bordeaux, and Bacillus subtilis, or Rhapsody. And really, all of these things in a home lawn really don't need treatment. So that takes care of insects and diseases. Check them off your list. We don't need to use those products. Weed control is a whole nother thing. Mowing your lawn properly, watering and fertilizing can help, but you're still probably going to have some weeds. So hand dig or pull them when you can. My husband loves to go out and spud dandelions. No, he won't come to your house and do it for you. He's got enough in my yard. And we recommend that you spot treat with herbicides if you, if, if the, the you know, there are a few in your lawn that exist. All of the USDA approved organic weed killers kill both weeds and grass, except for the chelated iron product. Most of them kill the leaves only, but not the roots. In fact, all of them do. So that's a problem. There just aren't any products out there that are like a broadleaf weed killer, that you can go around and squirt your dandelions and not kill your grass and have it kill the dandelion all the way down to the roots. There are no systemics. I don't know how I did this, but I got this all mixed up. There we go. So, vinegar, soaps, plant oils, they burn the weeds, but they burn the lawn too, but not the roots. And these products are the ones that the EPA doesn't do any testing or registration on, so you don't really know if they're going to work or not. Um, chelated iron is one that you're finding quite commonly now. If you look on the label for active ingredients on weed control products that are called organic, the chelated iron ones will say F-E-H-E-D-T-A. It does not burn the grass. It will burn broadleaf weeds, but not the roots. No, I, I, but, I have used a commercial chelated iron. Ah. The one that you find available for homeowners is such a low percent of iron that, you know, the weeds might come back. But the commercial one will turn the dandelion black <laughs> in that day, and it will not come back. And it will not come back. So but so work. the but ones so that expensive. you can use for homeowners, oh, that's interesting, too. Um, Dr. Soldat feels that this is the best hope that we have for a weed control product because at least you're killing back the tops. And if you do that often enough, you're weakening the root system. It's that concept of starvation of a weed. So you do it often enough, you're going to starve out that root system, and it will keep your weeds down. It may not take care of them completely. And then there's corn gluten meal, and this is a real popular one these days. And most people I talk to who have tried to use it have ended up giving up for a couple of reasons. One is it's very expensive. Um, you have to use a lot of it. Some people use it as a fertilizer too. It's 9% nitrogen. So again, to get 25% nitrogen, you have to use three times the product to, to get that amount of nitrogen if you're using it for, for fertilizer. Um, it is a pre-emergent. It is not post-emergent. So you don't put it on existing weeds. You put it there to prevent weeds from growing. The problem is that it doesn't work ever to 100%. It, the first year will work to about 25% of the weeds, seeds. It'll keep them from germinating, but the other 75% germinate. The next year, you might get 50% weed seed suppression, but 50% will grow. And then the next year, you may get 75%. But that's as high as you'll ever go. And so people look at that. It's very expensive. You put all that money into it, and you still have weeds all over your yard. <laughs> so a lot of people give up on it for that. 
it is very expensive. Plus, there is the issue. <laughs> are we are we going to the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Genetically yeah. If it's from genetically modified corn, and you're a purist about organic products, then you can't use corn gluten meal either. And it's corn gluten meal, not corn gluten feed. Yeah, it is corn gluten meal, not corn gluten feed. Yeah. And what was that? Because of the genetic modification, probably be toxic to chemicals. No, not necessarily. No, no. That's a that's a leap that a lot of people make that is not really accurate. Genetic modification doesn't necessarily mean that the the product is going to have the um, BT in it, and that's the what's. Um, toxic to caterpillars, but that's not going to be in the corn gluten meal. Because of processing and because of the stage that that product is at. But it is not considered, on organic food standards, it's not considered organic. So you can't use it. So then we talked about those minimum risk products. Here's just a little bit more about them. The vinegar, soaps, and oils. Um, and they are, are deemed to be okay for people to use without testing and registration because they um, are from natural sources, sources, they don't have very much processing, they retain a lot of their natural compounds. Um, they might be classified as USDA organic, again for food, or they may not. None of them are scientifically verified as beneficial for turf in Wisconsin, although they might be, <laughs> but since they're not verified as being scientifically verified to be beneficial for turf, they're really not legal to use for turf in Wisconsin. And here's the somewhere in between. And this, there's a whole publication on this. It's a very short publication. It really just basically says a lot of what we've already said for there are six key requirements to have a do-it-yourself or alternative lawn, and that is to prepare the soil properly when you plant the soil, plant the grass, plant the right grass seed for the right conditions, mow the lawn as high as possible, provide sufficient nutrients for it, uh, control pests, and irrigate sufficiently. Um, and that's the basis of that do-it-yourself alternative lawn care. But this doesn't cover all of our lawn issues. We have lots of other things. Creeping Charlie, you don't have a problem with that up here, do you? Yes. <laughs> everybody hates Creeping Charlie. It's on everybody's mind. Um, we do have a good publication on that. Moss in the lawn. Moss is there because the conditions are right for the moss to grow. You need to change the conditions is the only way to prevent the moss from growing. There's all kinds of products you can use, but they're not effective as long as those conditions are still there, you're going to have moss. Ants in the lawn. Yeah, ant mounds that kind of travel around your yard and stuff. The trick is getting that product down deep enough. And I don't think there's any organic way to do it. People say, oh, I go out there with boiling water and I pour it in there. I think that Dr. Uh, Dr. Phil, Phil Pelletieri calls that revenge, <laughs> revenge <laughs> tactics. It makes you feel good, but it doesn't really take care of the queen way down in that ant mound. And um, we do have a, a fact sheet on that, too. So, you know, there are lots of issues that crop up in lawns, but, you know, basically your, your choices are this conventional or organic and then somewhere in between. And it really is your choice, and we do need to provide that information to, to others that we talk to. And I wanted you to be aware of the changes that are made in the lawn care recommendations now through the new research that they've done at the, the research station, at the OJ Norm Research Station. So that concludes the presentation. Do I have any questions? Yeah. What is your comment on uh, running up uh, leaves in the fall and leaving them set? Leaving leaves on the lawn? Excellent. As long as you can see the lawn through the chopped up leaves, you're fine. Because they, they too add organic matter to the soil, and there is some nutrition in those leaves. Other questions? I just wonder yeah. uh, when you're talking about top dressing uh, using manure, um, I found that a lot.
lot of the stuff commercially available in bags has been pasteurized, and a lot of the benefits of the compost you're getting uh, are in the micronutrient or the uh, microorganisms that yeah. are in there. So to fully get the effects of that, yeah, that's a good point. If it's been pasteurized for either compost or manure, composted manure, um, when the microorganisms have been killed. It, right, that's a good point. Good point. Other points? Other comments? Other questions? Are you okay? No, I know you are. <laughs> so, well, thanks very much for your attention this evening, and I hope you guys have fun.